The following program is a dramatic reenactment. Certain events have been altered and names have been changed. The story you're about to see is based upon first-hand accounts of the actual events. The world's most elite fighting force launches a bold rescue. Within the walls of the U.S. Embassy in Mogadishu, hundreds seek safe haven. Outside, a civil war erupts. The Navy SEALs race into a nation in collapse to save civilians and diplomats from certain death. In 1961, an elite team of special forces was created for covert operations on the sea, air, and land. Their missions have been kept secret for national security reasons. Who they are, what they do, has remained shrouded in secrecy. Now, based on first-hand accounts of classified operations, these are the untold stories of the Navy SEALs. January 1991, civil war had erupted in the African country of Somalia. Rebel factions were fighting in the streets of the capital city, Mogadishu. Standing in the midst of it all was the last safe haven of Western democracy, the United States Embassy. Not again. Amy McAfee, the ambassador's assistant, had left the compound earlier in the day to evacuate her house. Hold on. Upon her return, she discovered a faulty gate was keeping her prisoner in the escalating pandemonium. McAfee had been in the Foreign Service for seven years, even taken the terrorist response course mandated for State Department employees. But nothing prepared her for this. There was anarchy in the streets. The few Marines assigned to the embassy were outgunned and unprepared. Widespread looting had broken out. The situation was quickly becoming desperate. I'll try, it worked last time. Teenage boys high on a drug named Ka became armed terrorists. Driving what they called technicals or pickup trucks mounted with machine guns. They would kill at random. McAfee finally made it inside the compound. How long it would remain a sanctuary was not clear. It was time to evacuate Mogadishu. But how? The U.S. Embassy was surrounded by the chaos in the streets. Over a dozen armed factions were fighting the Somalian government troops for control of the country. Lines of command were breaking down. There were police assassinations. Civilians were terrorized. Government troops turned on their officers because they were from a different tribe. Ancient boundaries and loyalties were fast becoming the order of the day. I need a secure line. Oh. U.S. Ambassador Frank James, dead. a veteran diplomat, had seen this coming. 23 well, years in dead. foreign service had taught him one uh, thing. Diplomacy is the first dead. thing to be sacrificed during a civil war. Oh, Survival was the only law. The ambassador and his staff had rehearsed for emergencies. 
However, they had not anticipated the failure of the telephones. You better patch us through on the radio. State Department. I made a little time for that. I'm afraid we don't have time. The ambassador needed to get a message right. through to the State Department. Hello, this is uh, Ambassador James, U.S. Embassy, Mogadishu. K-7 area overrun with government factions. We've retreated to the embassy compound. Transmitting by radio, he had no way of confirming that his message was received. Two weeks earlier, as a precaution, James had ordered all embassy families to be sent home. At least they were safe. With the rebel factions pressing in, he wasn't sure if he and his staff would ever see them again. In January 1991, the focus of America's military attention was in the Gulf, preparing to oust Saddam Hussein's forces from Kuwait. The world watched as military leaders mobilized a massive joint task force to invade Iraq. War was imminent. Pentagon officials were caught off guard by the crisis in Somalia. It's from the State Department, Ambassador James. The Pentagon war planners listened to Ambassador James' urgent message and call for help. The embassy was surrounded, and there was no way out. The time for diplomatic solutions was long past. Sir, the ambassador says, and I quote, there doesn't seem to be any government. The command staff quickly assessed their options. Ambassador James had asked for paratroopers to be sent in from Saudi Arabia. But paratroopers would be easy targets with so many Somalis on the ground wielding weapons. Their only hope was a SEAL team on board the USS Guam in the North Arabian Sea. Just the force needed for a complex evacuation. The flag officers quickly devised a bold plan. They'd have to send in the SEALs by helicopter under the cover of darkness if there was any chance of rescuing the embassy staff. spread that the American embassy was the last safe haven in the city. Diplomats from every nation were asking for refuge. Head of security, Bob Gorman, realized the only way to silence the rebels' guns was to let money talk. He had learned during his stint in Mogadishu that anything could be bought for a price especially now under mob rule. The chief instigator of this practice was a man who dubbed himself Major Saeed. Though he was only a local police official, he ran his own protection racket in Reign of Terror. He was an opportunist and quickly realized he could profit from the current chaos. Desperate people will pay anything for even a small measure of security, and the ragtag police force he controlled could offer just that. Growing up in the inner city, Gorman had witnessed local gangs intimidate their rivals. He understood Saeed's methods and motives. evening when Admiral Larry Walker got his orders to rescue All right. the embassy. Although his men were well trained, they had little time and information. <clears throat> Walker needed both for a successful mission. If there was Eight one man who could trust to think on his feet, it was Lieutenant Commander Mike Dillon. A veteran SEAL, Dillon had proven himself in several conflicts. Come on in. Get yourself situated. 
Beyond his tactical proficiency, Dillon was politically savvy as well. The Admiral considered him perfect for the job. But the mission would still be extremely difficult. Getting there was the first hurdle. The SEALs, along with a backup squad of Marines, would fly hundreds yeah. of miles by helicopter. Well, is here going to be going to Using night vision goggles, the pilots would navigate through the darkness. Your job is to get in there and make sure that the ambassador is secured and kept safe. Any questions? Admiral, any idea what kind of firepower we're going to see when we're on the ground? Most likely it'll be AK-47. Once inside the embassy compound, they would reinforce and hold a perimeter tentatively held by the U.S. Embassy Marines on the ground. The SEALs were to ensure the safety of the ambassador and to hold off any advancing forces until the ship could steam closer. Then they could carry out a full-scale evacuation. Sir, we're receiving an unsecured message from Ambassador James. Put it on speaker. Hello, this is Ambassador James, U.S. Embassy in Mogadishu. K-7 area overrun the government factions. Request you send rescue operation with all possible haste. Let's go, gentlemen. Let's go, guys. Wake up. The SEAL team left the deck of the Guam that night, uncertain of what lay ahead. They only knew that innocent people were trapped and needed to be rescued. As the Americans waited for help to arrive, the embassy was overflowing with non-American diplomats seeking rescue. The helicopter was nearing the African coast as Dylan briefed his troops. We haven't had a chance to discuss, let alone rehearse this scenario. We gotta get it right the first time. Anybody been to Somalia? No, sir. No. Never. Anyone could be an enemy or a friend. We have to remember to use our first weapon up here. Let's be vigilant professional, gentlemen. Each man checked and rechecked his equipment. Though they were safe for now, waiting and wondering seemed worse than any potential conflict that lay before them. Tensions continued to escalate at the embassy. Every life was bartered for price continued to climb. The payoffs to Saeed made the other rebel groups want a piece of the action as well. Gorman was keeping Saeed at bay, but he couldn't begin to manage the volatility of the other groups. It was only a matter of time until they initiated an assault. Based on my calculations, we're only a few minutes out. We're gonna be inserting from the south here, heading up over the airport. Most of the fighting's in the northern section. Boss, this map's outdated. It's all they had on board. Their information was obsolete, their intelligence data virtually non-existent. They couldn't afford to reconnoiter the city looking for their touchdown. They'd be the only chopper in flight around Mogadishu, making them an easy target. All right, we're gonna be coming in. There was heavy fighting in the north of the city. The pilot took a low-level insertion profile from the south, hoping to dodge enemy radar. Flying in at 150 knots and only 100 feet off the deck made for a rough ride. But it was about to get rough. Hold on, we've been painted! The enemy radar found them and locked onto the chopper. They dropped even lower and avoided enemy fire, screaming in 75 feet above the ground. It says the compound's surrounded by a large white wall! There were no ground beacons for the aircraft to lock onto. Negative, sir! Their maps were outdated. The 
pilots navigated through the area using known visual reference points. Damn it, where is this place? Every minute the chopper remained airborne, it was an open target. Saeed was content with the money he had extracted from the Americans. But word soon traveled like wildfire about cash reserves at the United States Embassy. Determined to get their share, other Somali factions began storming the embassy. They're coming over the walls. The fighting in the streets was spilling over into the embassy compound. Hit those lights. Over a dozen rebels wielding AK-47s were seconds away from ransacking the embassy compound. And there was no way to stop them. The six Marines stationed at the embassy were no match for the attacking rebels. When the SEAL rescue team finally saw the gleaming white walls of the embassy, the situation was critical. The Somali soldiers began their assault on the embassy. Hold on, boys, while I send them out! The pilot banked the helicopter. The 100 mile per hour downdraft blew the Somali looters off the wall like paper. The SEALs were unaware that a few rebels had fallen inside the compound. Once on the ground, first priority was to secure the embassy grounds. Even one well-placed bullet from close range could disable the helicopter. not to shoot. What? Who the hell are you? Ambassador James! James recognized that no matter how dire the situation, diplomacy still must supersede military action. We don't want to be responsible for this situation escalating into a full-scale conflict. The order was clear. They could not fire on any Somalis unless they were actually inside the walls of the compound. Okay, rules of engagement. Take your positions and no shots fired. The tangle sets a foot over that wall. Pop him. Yes, sir. Not returning fire placed them at a disadvantage. But the SEALs followed orders, though it put their lives in danger. Members of the SEAL team took to the rooftops to gain better vantage points. Word of the SEAL's arrival spread quickly through the streets. The havoc outside the walls died down. The soldiers and cruising technicals had disappeared, at least for now. If you're ready to load the chopper now, we can take at least 60 people. Excellent. That'll cover most non-embassy Americans and non-essentials. They're ready now. Though James and Gorman were anxious to evacuate, they worried about the helicopters drawing enemy fire. Dylan insisted if they left immediately, the Somalis would still be in disarray. If we leave now, they won't be ready. Dylan was finally able to convince the ambassador. We're wasting valuable time. Dylan and his 
Rose's men would have to load the chopper quickly before the Somalis could respond. The chopper could hold only 60 passengers, but there were at least three times that many at the embassy. The others would have to wait until the Guam got in closer. Dylan got the first wave of evacuees onto the chopper. But they weren't safe yet. The chopper would be most vulnerable those first few seconds after liftoff, when a rocket-propelled grenade could bring it down. Thank you for flying U.S. Navy, ladies and gentlemen. Saeed was furious that the helicopter had escaped. Every departing American meant thousands of lost protection dollars. The Major concluded that the Americans couldn't fit everyone inside the embassy on one helicopter. As long as people remained in the embassy, he could exploit the situation for his personal gain. eerie calm descended over the embassy, which only served to heighten the SEAL team's concern. Were the rebels going to leave them alone, or were they simply maneuvering into position for another assault? There was no time to wait. The ambassador's staff hurriedly prepared for evacuation. Admiral, we clear the chopper. We're not out of the woods yet. Can you hold the compound till we return? We'll do our best, sir. Admiral, we, I may be sending you some strange bedfellows. James warned the Admiral that he'd be sending diplomats from over 30 countries. Bringing unfriendlies on board a US warship could pose a security risk, and Walker would have to prepare. The Admiral was aware that the Guam was making good time towards Somalia but they had over 200 more people to evacuate before dawn. Refugees still tried to make their way to the embassy, but that was becoming increasingly difficult, if not impossible. We have a situation. Three American citizens stranded in the K-7 area. Husband, wife, and child. Why didn't they come when I sent out a warning three days ago? Their electricity's been out. How far is it? Where did you say it was? K-7. About six blocks. Six blocks through a shooting gallery of rebel forces. It could be a suicide mission for the SEALs, despite his noble objective. Because of his extensive experience, Dylan would have to lead the team leaving a few of his men behind under Gorman's command. Let's go. The embassy still had two of its light armor utility vehicles that hadn't been destroyed or lost to extortions. An embassy marine would serve as navigator. He was familiar with the street, but negotiating the surrounding chaos was anyone's game. Seals are trained to think clearly in the midst of uncertainty, and Dylan was determined to assess and respond without distraction. Left. We'll dog leg over. James could not officially authorize the use of weapons outside the compound. 
However, it was understood that the SEALs would use whatever force necessary to rescue the stranded Americans. Commander Dillon wasn't going to provoke an incident. If he could avoid using his weapons, he would. Something's up. Watch your six. Copy that. Nothing back here. Training had taught Dylan not to let the opposition eliminate one's options. Correction, sir. We have a little traffic behind us. Looks like a technical. Thanks. I see it. Giving these ace mechanics up here another second. Trap! Back up! Back up! Back up! We boxed this, sir! We boxed this! Follow my lead! Stay close! their destination, but the family wasn't at the rendezvous point. Where are they? They were supposed to be right in the doorway. All right. Plan B. Stay with the sergeant and guard the vehicles. You two are with me. We're going in. Though the building was quiet, the SEALs remained vigilant. Searching for the family endangered his team as well as the primary mission objective, evacuating the embassy. Yet Dylan proceeded. they'd found the right place, but what greeted them certainly didn't sound friendly. Put your weapon down! Put your gun down! Now! 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 Put it put down! Put it down! Stop! 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 Grab the barrel of the weapon! Don't shoot! Don't shoot! Put it on the ground, sir! Slowly! Step away from the weapon! Let me see some identification, please! Very slowly, sir! You got yourself killed, sir. All right, let's get out of here. Follow me. Stay close behind me. Take the lead. Back at the embassy, the sentries waited for the return of the rescue team. It was quiet. Maybe too quiet. Hey guys, what's going on at the front gate, over? Not sure yet. It looks like we got company. The Rebels had launched another attack. What the hell's happening? Damn it, was close. As they stopped to reload, the rescue team returned to the embassy. Outflanked, the rebel soldiers fled. Situation.
situation diffused. We see you. The gate's opening. The Guam continued towards the East African coast at flank speed. Admiral Walker had calculated the number of helicopter trips he'd need to evacuate the embassy. They could do it, but there could be no delay. They unloaded the first evacuees and immediately turned the helicopter around. Unbeknownst to Walker, Diplomats from other countries were pouring into the embassy looking for safe passage out of Somalia. Ambassador James and his staff were faced with the most difficult decisions. Only American citizens and those with proper passports could be evacuated without violating international law. Even Somali nationals that had worked at the embassy for years had to be left behind. It was diplomatic triage, and James certainly didn't relish the task. The streets outside the embassy remained a powder keg ready to explode. But the seals would not be provoked. Back, and here's the chopper. They landed safely again. However, with the rebels now aware of the helicopters, the second trip back to the ship could be even more dangerous than the first. The Somalis could lock onto their flight path and possibly bring the aircraft down. One o'clock, I got five. That's nine. Boss, looks like we got visitors at the gate. On my way. Friendlies? Uh, that's a negative, boss man. Not unless the welcome wagon's driving around with anti-tank guns. Major Saeed had returned. His arrival threatened the evacuation effort. What do you think, boss? I don't know. Let's take a look. Take my left. Request permission to speak to Ambassador James. Identify yourself. I am Major Saeed. You got him covered? Like a fly on sugar. Hold him, I'll be back. He's got an anti-tank gun in his truck, 10 men and a grenade in his hand. Ambassador James and Gorman explained to Commander Dillon that Saeed had been soliciting bribes for safe passage. But Dillon saw a way to turn the tables on Saeed. If Saeed were brought onto the compound and isolated from his men, he'd be powerless. And we can evacuate everyone without a firefight. I think it might be just the breakthrough we need. Ambassador, I'm gonna insist you wear this. The meeting was risky, but they counted on the one thing that would distract Saeed. Money. One wrong move by Saeed and we take him out. He's on embassy grounds. I won't hold fire on this. Absolutely. The boarding evacuees would have to wait for James and the SEALs to deal with Saeed. Here 
us each step of the way in the airpiece. My snipers will be covering you from up top. We'll say clear on your every step. If you hear left, you immediately drop to your left. All right? Cough, if you understand. <coughs> Good luck, sir. Ambassador, what can we do for you this evening? Dylan demanded that the Major hand over his grenade. He had to disarm Saeed if he was going to achieve his objective. If you wish to speak with the Ambassador, I'm going to have to insist. Saeed reluctantly agreed to give up his weapons. And the radio. But the Major wouldn't relinquish his radio. Please come in. If their plan was to be successful, they had to get the radio. You on them? Counting his breath, sir. Dylan had emphasized to the ambassador that he was about to enter the diplomatic negotiation of his life. One wrong move on his part, and they would all pay a price. Come in, Major. Please, Major, have a seat. The ambassador's first task was to put the major at ease. Drink. Though Saeed was there to negotiate, Dylan had an alternative purpose. To buy time until the helicopters could leave. To ease tensions. Their every move was being watched by the SEALs just outside. Saeed probed to find every opportunity he could to profit from the Americans' predicament. He even offered to protect them during their evacuation. Ambassador James downplayed the evacuation, saying they were simply relocating staff until things settled down. Loading them up. With Saeed distracted, they could now continue with the evacuation. But before they could fly, they'd still need to get that radio. The chopper is loaded and ready to take off, sir. Then my men can help. Can't let him talk to his men. We need to get that radio. I think we understand one another, Major. Amy, would you bring in the keys to the cash box, please? Thank you. If you would follow me, Major. The ploy worked. Saeed had left his radio. The helicopter made a run for it. Saeed's men didn't fire. If they did, the Americans might kill Saeed. Sixty more evacuees were on their way to the ship, but there were still many left to go. It would take only ten minutes for the next helicopter to arrive. The negotiations continued without a hitch. Would you consider this an adequate down payment? The sound of the music blocked out the helicopter's departure, and the money placated Saeed. As 
soon as the next helicopter arrived, another group of evacuees moved to the landing area. Dylan's plan was working like clockwork. Cigar major. The ambassador continued to play the generous host, buying precious time. Another drink. One by one, the choppers came and left with their cargo. Saeed was playing right into their hands. The plan was on track. By now, the Guam was just off the Somali coast. The choppers were turning around in minutes. The Somali soldiers were becoming alarmed. Saeed might be held prisoner. Of them? One more group, sir! How's the ambassador holding up? Like long lost friends. Aged. Aged in oak. Mm. Dawn was minutes away. This was the last time the chopper could safely land under the cover of darkness. Everyone leaving the embassy had to be on this last helicopter, including the SEALs. That's the last of them, sir! We've got an empty house! Round up the man! I'll get James! The Somali soldiers could wait no longer. They began their assault. Ready to go, sir. What? My radio. You lied, Major. Major, the United States like to keep his friends riding in style. James offered the embassy's Mercedes if the Major would ensure safe passage. Sir, it's time. Before the helicopter was fully loaded, the Major's men forced their way into the compound. The Ambassador and Dylan didn't know if Saeed would take their final bribe or retaliate and shoot down the last helicopter. They're breaching the perimeter. They're coming to the front gate. They breached the compound. They breached the perimeter. Let's go. Let's go. Let's go. But leaving now was a gamble they'd have to take. There was no time to lose. The embassy was under attack. Yes, sir! Let's go! Let's get out of here! The Major, it seemed, had kept his word. The last of the evacuees safely cleared the compound. But the celebration was short-lived. An evasive move by the pilot barely dodged an incoming missile. Commander. My men and I need a lift to the Trenton. Can we get a chopper? Not yet. The Admiral wants a debriefing with you and your SEAL team immediately down the conference room. 
So much for rack time. Later, they would learn from news reports that the entire embassy was overrun and ransacked by the rebels. They had just made it out. The fate of Major Saeed and the other Somali soldiers is unknown. Overall, it was a mission executed flawlessly. 281 people rescued, including eight ambassadors, four charges d'affaires, and 41 children. When people look back on the Somalia embassy rescue, some might say they made it look easy. But for Dylan, James, and the others, they knew. The only easy day is yesterday.